thank you very much for making it here in person. I know there is an academic symposium going on too, so thank you for those who make the walk, made the walk, and for those attending virtually. Uh, I think uh, you will really enjoy this session. Uh, so you see so many people on stage. Uh, so you will, you're going to see people from two teams. That is the Amy team and the Atabotics team. So they're going to do a joint presentation on some of the work we've been doing over the past few months. Um, so there's going to be lots of cool videos. You'll enjoy it. I'll just do a very quick introduction, and then I'll pass it to uh, everyone in the team to start presenting. Uh, so right to my left is uh, Sean. Uh, he's the director of R&D at Atabotics. And his, his teammates are sort of sitting. Uh, I guess we are not in the right order, but it's Arna, Nick, and Nico. Uh, they're going to introduce themselves more. And then from our side, uh, so a lot of the, most of the hands-on work was done by Laura and Sahir, who are sitting here. And, and I think Matt Taylor doesn't re require any introduction. He's a professor at University of Alberta and also a fellow at Amy. And he's been advising on the project. Um, I'll pass it on to Sean. Uh, so we're going to do a presentation, and at the end, there'll, there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion. Um, so enjoy the talk. Hello, everyone. Sean Murphy. I'm Director of Innovation at Atabotics. So Atabotics is an ASRS, Automated Storage and Retrieval System, based off ants. If ants could sue us for IP infringement, they would. We store stuff in the same method that they do. So we take an, uh, a legacy warehouse, and we stack it vertical. So we take all those goods, and we move it into a robotic system that we call an Ada Nest. And see, these are the robots. They don't look like ants, but they act in the same way. They store the bins front, back, left, and right. <clears throat> and these systems, this is an example of it going down and putting away a bin, and then picking up a bin. So eventually, the bin will go to a human pick station. Now, these ants are about 200 pounds. They're two feet by two feet, uh, big enough for a Stanley Cup Edmonton, I believe. <laughs> and it'll eventually go to a, a human to pick. So this is where the human does the picking. Imagine an e-commerce order. You order socks, uh, you order t-shirts, et cetera, and then it gets uh, sorted by the human into a put wall, we call it. And so you can imagine you can get anything from that whole warehouse in a matter of minutes, sometimes sub-minute. So you can imagine there's a lot of decision points happening here on both what to pick, when to pick it, what uh, bin to select, where to put those bins in that add a nest. So we have a lot of choices to make. And then we have advanced pick stations, which require only images. It's pretty self-explanatory what to pick, so making it very easy on the humans. So we have a few levels of uh, picking. Human, robot arm, and also some other automation. So just in, some interesting fact, the, these, these ants, they operate on lithium ion, uh, so, sorry, uh, cap banks. So that ascent, it charges the whole ant for about 20, it takes eight seconds to charge that ant, and then operates for about 20 minutes. So the sizes of antibiotic structures are quite small, modular, all the way up to medium, up to football fields in size. In this example on the screen, we've got several uh, pick stations. And some of our installations, like our installation in LA, it's uh, 60 pick stations. This here's our micro unit. So we go from small, which is where we're doing a lot of our AI work, to very large. So another example of configuration of the bins. You can imagine the amount of choices we have to make as to where to put products in all these bins. So we go from medical to food service up to uh, where other warehousing, uh, uh, automotive, beauty, uh, et cetera. And these are real installations all over North America. And we're going into Europe as well. So modular, and they can grow, actually. So once you have an antibiotics installation, it can grow. So meaning whatever you train, imagine you have an AI model and you train it on a certain side, size, you can, it can grow. So that's it for this bit. So the value proposition. We seek to uh, reduce fulfillment uh, warehouse space by 85% and the operating cost by 75%. So to do this, you can imagine it takes robot evolution, operating efficiencies, and AI in bold, right? So a while ago, we started uh, two projects to increase throughput 
and reliability. And we'll cover into each of these uh, sections. And we've had some very interesting early prototypes and successes. On that note. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean. So I'll take it from here on the throughput set, uh, set of things. So um, as Sean gave an intro of how an antibiotic nest looks like, and there are various sizes, various nests, and on the picture you see um, there are multiple, in fact, hundreds and thousands of bins and spaces for the robots to move in. And given the, given the structure, there are dozens of robots, or as, it, as we call it, ants, um, the idea is to fulfill maximum orders in the minimum amount of time, or minimize the number of time it takes to fulfill the orders, or, maxima, or maximize the orders that come in, uh, fulfill those orders. So uh, more of a specifics on how this all fits for antibiotics uh, in terms of AI, how it's fruitful, and um, so setting up the operation or the perspective, so the details. So as I said, dozens of robots, hundreds and thousands of spaces um, having bins, and then bins have particular compartments, one to 16 to be specific, and then those com compartments would have SKUs or items. And then each order that come into, in, into the nest, the task is to fulfill it as soon as possible. So we get this decision, we, we gotta make these decisions quickly, and we gotta make it make smart decisions, smart decisions, right? So these are like, if, if you look at it, these are ex, like in, in an order of exponential set of decisions to make. Um, dozens of robots picking uh, hundreds of thousands of bins, and you gotta select smarter bins to fulfill. So that's one side of maximizing throughput, which is order fulfillment. Laura's gonna talk more about it. And um, if I move on to uh, the next one, so um, what I've been focusing on recently is um, in the atom and bin allocation. So we got this entire space, 3D space, 3D real space um, that spans meters. And um, the task is, so given, given a nest, uh, hundreds and thousands of bins, what's the optimal way to put in items into the bins so that the next day you, you, you come up and start the structure, you, you, you get that optimal throughput on that day. So uh, we started with um, going through the historical data of orders being processed, the, the items um, coming in. And one of the scratches to the surface before moving to ML is uh, starting with the historical proportions, the frequencies that coming in with respect to the uh, the items, and then so if the items are really hot, like they they go in fast, they're, they're ordered pretty much, so it's, it makes sense to put them in more bins, and and see see how that goes. So we did that, and the, the early experimental results show an eight percent improvement overall on thousands of orders we tested on. So that just that's just again the, the scratch of the surface. Like think about how data mining um, and Moving into RL, I'll, I'll come in a bit. But data mining, tracking the uh, affinity, um, like the, the items that go together. So an e-commerce example would be uh, popcorn and, and beer, for example, right? So that, that kind of thing, that kind of tracking, that, that kind of affinity we, might, we want to do uh, uh, moving forward. And, and the, the idea is, um, in an ideal world, we want to do it in RL, where we start with a structure we don't know anything about, and then moving on with days and orders being processed, we know over time what's the best and optimal way coming in from the data we see, the, the orders we're seeing. So set up that structure in a way that maximizes throughput. So that's, that's the stream of stuff that I've been doing with antibiotics. So with that, I'll, I'll hand over to, to Laura for the maximizing order fulfillment. Thanks, Sahir. Okay, so I've been working on maximizing throughput from the uh, view of how to fulfill orders. So given all the SKUs placed into bins, um, and we want to increase the number of orders being fulfilled every hour. So we want to are looking at what influences this throughput time. So we've really found that the time to pick up a bin and bring it to a workstation has a huge effect. So if you think about it, an item could be placed in hundreds of different locations within the nest, depending on the size. And then also, as the ant gets to a workstation, whether or not it has to wait in a queue or a line in order before it gets presented at the workstation for the human to pick and put it into a box to be shipped to the customer. So this leads us uh, to the ant cycle time. So from the time an ant is being sent one of these commands, it goes and picks up the bin and then brings it to the workstation. And then the human picker 
picks the item from the bin and puts it to be shipped off. So we are calling this the ant cycle time and uh, it leads us to two kind of main decision points where we can control um, how to reduce this cycle time. So we're looking at when a workstation has open space, which orders should we open at it? And then also, when an ant becomes available, which bin do we want to send it to go and pick up and bring it to which workstation? So we have these decision-making points where we can kind of train our learning agents to make smarter choices. So in this project, I mainly focus on deciding which bin should be chosen. And you can see on the right, this is uh, the emulator of the nest structure that I mainly work with when testing out our different strategies. Okay, so how do we decide which bin an ant should bring to a workstation? So at the beginning, we're keeping it super simple. So we're building a regression model from our ant cycle time data that we've been collecting, and we are using it to estimate the time it would take an ant to collect and deliver a bin to a workstation. So we use this time estimate as input into a simple kind of rule-based decision-making agent. And so we're testing out the most simple thing first to see like what sort of improvements we can expect from these machine learning methods moving forward. So I have a video for you, kind of show it in action. These are our preliminary initial results. So our experimental kind of setup was we have 30 orders to complete. We have four workstations. And you can see on the left here, this is the default agent behavior where um, it's going and collecting. We haven't started making any of the decision-making points yet. On the right is our latest one where we're using the supervised learning models in order to estimate the time it'll take an ant to complete an order. And so you can see for this one, our new agent, it takes about 30 minutes to complete 30 orders. Mm -hmm. um, or we're looking at maximizing our KPI, which is lines per hour. How many order lines can we fulfill? You can think of it as one item equals an order line. So this was our uh, original ACT agent, our ACT cycle time agent that we started with. So already we've improved from there. <laughs> And so here you can see this is the original one that we're starting, our baseline that we're using to compare with everything. And it takes around an hour and a half in order to complete the same 30 orders. So already just keeping it simple, we're seeing these drastic improvements. So from here, I will hand over to Arna. Wait, this one. Perfect, thank you. Uh, so one of the super exciting parts about this uh, project is that the goal is to run it on a live structure. Like we want to actually use this stuff in the real world. So um, the way that we've structured our code and that, that we've written all our, all our processes is with that goal in mind, to run it uh, on a real structure. Um, so as Laura showed the, the Nexus uh, simulator, so the agent can control the simulator, but then this simulator can, can can send commands to physical structures. Um, so the simulator thinks that it's actually controlling physical structures when Laura's running her simulations, but I can connect it to an actual real live structure and run the exact same agents um, in the same way that Laura does, but on a live structure. So I also made a video <laughs> of me picking orders uh, on the microphone. It's called a microsystem, a small system that we have in the R&D at Atabotics. Um, so I submitted uh, eight orders with nine items each. Uh, I filled 200 bins with different colored water bottles. And so I'm going to uh, start picking these from the system. So in the top half of the screen is sort of the, the regular software is controlling um, which bin to pick and which workstation to bring it to. Um, only two orders can be open at a time, so I'm only in the middle part of the screen there is me uh, putting the water bottles. Each square represents an order, and there's nine water bottles per order, so I'm filling up um, each square as the bins arrive at the workstation. Uh, the bottom half of the screen is the agent um, that Laura also just showed in simulation. It's the exact same agent, but this time it's controlling a, a real system. Um, so yeah, the, the Bottom half of the screen is slowly going faster than the top half. Um, you can, the reason it's not um, going quite as fast as what Laura said, showed, like we're not having a three times improvement in speed, is because I'm only opening two orders at a time. So there's less chance for optimization 
Um, because one of the optimizations that, that the agent is doing is um, bringing a bin. Say uh, two orders are open, they both need, uh, the, uh, say, a red water bottle. Um, I'll pick two red water bottles from the same bin instead of bringing two bins over twice with red water bottles. So that's one, of the, one example of an optimization. And the more orders you open, the more chance you have for that type of optimization. So in this case, the sort of the regular software took ha about half an hour, and the agent took 23 minutes. So there was an improvement still. Um, so then the next step, so this agent is trained using sort of offline historical um, data. So the next step that we want to do is use RL to train an agent. So um, yeah, one of the challenges though with doing with doing that is that um, using this software is really slow. Like it runs real time, and you can't really speed it up. So what we needed to do is write an approximation um, of the structure, so that that sim approximates the behavior of the nest. But it runs, it's just software, so it runs in, in a couple of milliseconds on a computer. And then we're going to use that to train an RL agent. And that's Matt's specialty, so I'll let him talk. <laughs> Thank you. Do I stand this or go forward? You can go forward? I'll go forward. Oh, that is a good slide. So we've got some, just to kind of summarize, we've got some clear KPIs. We want to save space, we want to improve throughput. So we've got a lot, Adabotics has a lot of really smart engineers. This is a hard problem. And they made a lot of hand-coded optimizations. But then we said, okay, let's try to do a data-driven approach. Let's try to see what we can optimize. And we've, we've made some progress. But then the next step is what you've been hearing about all week, reinforcement learning. And as Carl was alluding, Carl, as Arno was alluding to, one of the problems with reinforcement learning is it can require a lot of data. So we look at some of the big wins in reinforcement learning, and it was using hundreds of years of data. We don't want antibiotics to wait hundreds of years. So instead, we've got this super fast approximate simulator, and that's going to be the key. So we're going to learn an approximate idea of how to control. So we've got these. Ants, the learning agent, that are interacting with the simulated antibiotics environment in this super fast simulation. Then we take what we learn there and transfer it to the nexus, which can be either the slow simulation or the physical robots. So some of you might have heard of sim to real, where you go from simulation to the real world. We can actually do sim to sim to real. So this is one of the reasons why this is such an exciting project, because reinforcement learning is this amazing hammer, but you really need the right nail. And it's great that this antibiotics problem is actually the right nail. So we're really looking forward to going, right now we're using ML to improve the existing processes, but with reinforcement learning, we'll really let the agent open up its decision-making process and hopefully think of things that, that our, our engineers haven't thought of yet and discover even better improvements. So that, let me hand it over. Okay. Thank you, everyone. I'm Nikolai Kumer, and I'm one of the data scientists at uh, Adabotics. And we're going to shift focus from maximizing throughput to maximizing uptime or reliability of the robots, and how AI and um, automation can help there. So at Adabotics, we have hundreds of robots in several structures all across North America. Each one of those robots sends back uh, a lot of telemetry into our cloud processing pipeline, which does uh, processing and analytics. Our main goal here is to use all of that information to reduce the amount of manual intervention that the human operator has to do to maintain a robot. Currently, what they do is there is a regularly scheduled automated maintenance checklist, and we uh, partnered with uh, AltaML to create this automated maintenance board that um, takes over a bunch of those tasks. So here, the Nexus calls a robot into this automated maintenance board during operation. The robot checks in, and we have a bunch of analysis scripts that use machine vision for uh, identification and classification to check the wheels and the gears. In this case, it detected some damage on the tire. 
We also check the uh, tolerance on the pickarm shuttle. And between the pickarm shuttle and the wheels, this is the main way with which the robots interact with the structure. So it's very important to um, check those regularly. The previous robot was not sent back into the structure because it was flagged for further intervention by a human operator. In this case, uh, this robot, I believe it's Ragnar, comes in and uh, is checked again. And here, no damage is detected and everything is within tolerance. So now this robot can go back into the structure and continue operation. This is very unintrusive and it does not require any kind of manual intervention. So this is cheaper and we can generate and collect a lot more information and track these robots throughout their life. So this is the, um, uh, the maintenance of the robot while it's in the structure. Before the robot is even allowed into the structure, we have this diagnostic test where the robot cycles through each of the drive through its full range of motion and then collects profile information and uploads it to the cloud. We then kick off analysis uh, tools that go ahead and classify each profile for each drive to make sure and compare it to how it's supposed to be and flag it for potentially um, denying uh, the welcoming process. Here's a sample output for drive one. We have some handcrafted features that we uh, run against these profiles and we compare how this specific profile compares to all of the, um, the history of all the robot fleet. That way we can identify outliers and flag uh, that robot, that specific drive for repair. Now we use handcrafted features because for us interpretability is important. We don't want to know why a drive failed. Well, we don't want to know that a drive failed. We want to know why so we can actually flag it to the repair personnel. In this particular case, this profile is supposed to be relatively flat, but due to the slope, it's, uh, there's likely some kind of a misalignment. So now the uh, human operator actually knows what to potentially fix. So this was the work, um, part of the work that we do on the robots. We are also doing a lot of um, analysis work on the structures themselves. So as Sean alluded to earlier, we have structures that range in size from very small like you saw in the uh, pictures to the size of a football field. Each one of those structures has down columns. Uh, those down columns are used by the robot to traverse vertically and access the bins. In each corner of those uh, down columns, there is gear racks, which the robots use to travel vertically. Um, currently, there is uh, usually like hundreds of down columns per structure, if it's big enough. And that means there's millions of teeth that need to be inspected. At the moment, this is being done manually, which means that there is a human who has to enter the structure and inspect a column that is potentially six meters tall or more. So in that case, uh, because of safety concerns, we have to shut down the structure and allow the person to enter and inspect. So we created, um, well, we modify the robot to uh, do the inspection themselves. So in this video, you see a laser scanner that scans the gear teeth as it traverses down the column. What we get from the laser profiler is a point cloud, which we then uh, created analysis methods for to extract every gear pair. And um, once we cluster it and uh, look at the entire column, you can see that damaged gears are very easily detected. So with this, we are actually automating the inspection process and we can do it while the system is running because all that it is is a robot is descending slowly down a column, which means that for about a minute or two, this column cannot be picked from. So with this, we have uh, automated structure inspection as well. I will now hand it over to Nico for some further work. Thank you. So another area where we're uh, working with AI is uh, to pre uh, increase order picking uh, efficiency. We are using AI uh, vision models to assist humans and robots in picking goods. Um, we have switched to um, synthetic data for our training because the vision models need a lot of data for, to train. So just to cut down on the training time, uh, we have switched to the synthetic data where we only need like between 20 and 50 images instead of 1,000 images per product. 
We then use those images to create a 3D model and create uh, more pictures to train the actual model with. Here's a quick overview how we use a, a few product images that, to create a 3D model. Uh, from that 3D model, we can use uh, 3D modeling software to create new views with different lighting settings. We can use the rendered images uh, to create our actual data set, which also has a pixel perfect uh, annotation of the products. We can untrain our models. We use several different model settings and train them side by side to find out which one works best for this specific data set. Uh, we can then deploy the model to either use in robotic picking, uh, where the model is used to locate product so the robot can pick it, or if a human is pick, picking the products, you can use it to identify instead of using a barcode scanning. So this is how our system works together with a third-party vendor, uh, Plus One Robotics. They specialize in product each picking. So our robot brings the bin to the robot. It can see where the product is located and can then do the picking. And for the manual operator, uh, we have a uh, demo system at Microsoft at their Industry Experience Center in Redmond, where we can show the picking uh, and the AI being used to identify products. We also have uh, some projectors installed that sh uh, show some extra information for the worker right into the bin. So it lights up the bin compartment, shows a picture on the tabletop, so you don't need to look uh, up at the monitor for any information. Everything's right there where you need it. AI uh, recognizes the products and updates your order. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, please help me uh, thank all the speakers for the presentation. All right, I, I think we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, to respect folks uh, attending virtually, just put up your hand, I'll bring the mic to you and you can ask your questions. Feel free to address to anyone in particular or just generally. No questions, seriously? Oh, there you go. <laughs> oh, you got it, okay. Hi, my background is RL as well. I'm just curious what type of RL algorithm you chose for your application, and uh, what was the reason behind that? Hi, uh, thank you for your question. Um, so we're just starting the RL journey, and uh, we're starting with uh, uh, Q learning to kind of uh, as an initial test case to see whether we can just keep it really simple and if it'll work for us. So we're hoping to see some improvements or in, uh, like even a decrease in improvement to gain any information we can and where we can go from there. So we're just starting the initial deployment of these models and very excited to see kind of where it leads from here. while the microphone's going to the next person. I'll just also uh, emphasize that in the previous session, Adam White was talking about water treatment plant, real world reinforcement learning using Epsilon, Greedy, and Sarsa. So we want to start as simple as we can, get that proof of concept working, and then maybe we'll scale up to really interesting algorithms if we have to, but only if that extra complexity is justified. Sorry for cutting off the next question. No problem. Uh, for the reinforcement learning setting, so this is clearly a multi-agent environment. So are you using only a local reward or, or also global reward as your reward function? And um, for example, and do you also consider um, cost of uh, finding items for, uh, in the bins? 
Yeah, so right now we're keeping it super simple and we're uh, going to be polling to make this at every decision making point. So as soon as an ant becomes unavailable, then we're going to uh, poll our agent to decide which bin to go and pick up. So we're kind of trying to constrain the problem. So we're starting with one workstation and when the ant becomes available, which bin do we want to go and pick up? And then we're using the time estimate, so the amount of time it'll go, it'll take to go and pick up that bin and bring it back into our reward function. And so in that case, uh, we can kind of get a better idea of uh, what's the optimal bin to go and pick. And once we have just seen that it works there in a very simple situation, then we're going to kind of expand it and uh, maybe bring it into like multi-agent environments and everything. But right now we're trying to keep it so it's just one agent making one decision. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so one of the questions from a uh, layman, in terms of computing power of RL compared to ML, do you, are you foreseeing that you will need a lot more computing power uh, to work on RL compared to ML? Yes. <laughs> And this, is, and this is really where that super fast simulator comes in. Because if we didn't have that, it would be impossible. But now we've got the super fast simulator that an agent can learn on. Ooh. Or maybe that agent could learn on two computers at the same time. Because it's just, wait, why can't that agent learn on 100 computers at the same time? So in the ML solutions we were deploying, we could collect a bunch of data, train in a matter of seconds or minutes. With reinforcement learning, it will take a lot more compute because the agent has to interact with the environment and make those decisions rather than just going over a passive complete data set. So that's, that's absolutely a concern when you're using RL. Luckily, Adabotics has a lot of resources and partners that have compute that, could, that can uh, make this all happen. So have, have you guys projected in terms of, because I was talking to some people at Amy, you know, a gentleman has sorted, solved the problem of Texas Hold'em. And when he did it a few years ago, four or five years ago, he took, I think, 4% or 6% of the Canadian computing power. So if we're going to try to solve RL uh, for a problem, uh, are you guys projecting like we'll take up 10% of the computing power of all of Canada? Or, or is it like in, uh, fractions of it uh, from that perspective? So, so no, we should need, need nowhere near that amount. But this, this brings us up an interesting problem that's, that's come up a few times, is if we're coming up with these, with these solutions that deliver value to a company, how do we account for all the compute we're using? How do we account for the energy, the environmental impact? And for this project, those are all going to be fairly small. The, you know, the compute is more than what you need on a laptop, but certainly less than you need for Texas Hold'em. Ironically. Um, but going forward, I think that's something that we as a community need to think about is, you know, if, if I want to make my Atari agent faster, is it worth burning down this amount of trees to, to, to fuel that compute? And that's, that's something that we as a community need to think about. Sean? And to add on to what Matt said, the amount of energy you save through optimization of the robot traversing in a structure is significant. Right. If you have to send them less distance, many of them less distance, you save a lot of energy as well. Thank you. Hi, on the human side, uh, how many occupations are you replacing and how many occupations are you creating? It's a common question. Uh, might be a whole separate topic to answer that one, though. Uh, I won't do it here, but catch me on the side and I'll give you a one opinion. I'll also point out that I believe Sahir and Laura were hired into Amy specifically for this project. Hello. Uh, I was just curious how the robots localize in that grid space, and how that's done. How do they know where they are? Can, can we repeat the question? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, sorry, I was just wondering, um, 
how do the robots localize in the, the grid space? Like, how do they know where they are in relation to the other robots so they don't hit them? Uh, yeah, so they're using um, QR codes for localization, and they communicate with a central nexus, and the central nexus verifies their location compared to a database. But they also have a camera on board that uh, tells it where it is relative to this, relative to the grid square. So, sorry, again, one question. Uh, have you guys looked at uh, uh, coming from localization? Have you looked at like other ways to uh, track data instead of just QR codes? And have you looked at ability to create an ent entire digital twin of, of the structures um, to uh, sort of help, help uh, further this? Yes, we have. Uh, there's a lot of options there. You have wireless location technologies. You have, uh, th those tend to be leading. We've had a lot of success with the visual indicators. Uh, so you go with what works best. But we do have several different methods. And what works best, that's what we've been rolling with. And what about in terms of digital twins? Uh, have you looked at possibility of creating digital twin of these entire structures? Uh, so digital twin, you're, you're speaking to digital twin. So what you saw on the screen there, the simulation was in essence a digital twin, right? It's a, it is an emulation, it's a simulation of what the computer thinks the structure is, and then it issues commands, and then it gets a response. So we're very close on digital twins, if that's what you're referring to. From like a visual perspective, from the ant itself, or visualizing the structure, it maybe go deeper. Yeah, maybe both, right? Uh, like for example, we, we will be having a meeting with a, uh, an airport, uh, where one of their biggest problems is taking trash out, because the trash bin becomes too heavy to be able to move those trash bins, right? And um, how do we visualize the data or, or, or the weight of the trash bin so it creates less human? So we're looking at ways that, you know, uh, how do we implement the entire system first in a digital twin and then use hopefully AI uh, or RL or machine learning to help solve these problems? It's a good Thank question. You. That's a really good question because uh, the dims, the dimensions matter a lot in our world as to what we can put in the bins. And once it's, <clears throat> once it's extracted from the bin, what happens once in, it's in the manual section of the warehouse or things that don't fit in the bin, right? So that simulation of the warehouse in general is something we're very much working on. Thank you, sir. I guess um, from a layman's perspective, what's the difference between a simulator and a digital twin? Simulator versus emulation? So the, uh, the simulator versus the digital twin, what's the difference? And the industry it, response, I know what we've done and what we're calling it, what we should be calling it. Matt, have you got a good answer to that one? It depends. <laughs> it, it depends who you're talking to. I think, I think the people haven't necessarily standardized on this. Usually when people are saying digital twin, they mean something that's as close as possible to real. But of course, any kind of simulation or emulation can never be 100%. So it's kind of wishy-washy. It's more of how close to real are you? Just going back to what we were saying before, you know, we, we could use RL on the robots. That would be slow. We could use RL on our, our Nexus simulator, our emulator. That's a little bit faster, but still slow. Or we could do RL on this really abstract process. But there's, there's trade-offs that go with, with speed and accuracy. But di digital twin in general means I've got some kind of simulator or emulator that's pretty close. And it's usually going to be a lot faster than the real world. And certainly, you don't have the same costs if something goes wrong. D does that make sense? And yes, we are guilty of calling it both digital twin and simulator, depending on the time of day. Yes. <laughs> 
Yeah, I think that's uh, everyone. I don't know if we get questions virtually. Is anyone checking? <laughs> I, I have no way of checking. I assume there are no questions virtually. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, one more. Hey, thank you for uh, sharing how you're, you're breaking down like this really complex process into small things that you can optimize. Um, speaking of that, like I, I just looked at the layout of your your the buildings, how they're kind of like this big giant box, and then there's like this little station on the side. Uh, but I'm wondering, like, does it have to be that way? Like, what if you had the the boxes as like the second floor or something, and then they, the things just came down, so you had more room for people, I don't know, like to see each other when they're doing the box stuff. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like, it creates like you and then there's like a giant box wall besides you and then i guess the next person would be besides another big giant box box wall love the idea what's your name please drop your resume at the at the, at the, at the <laughs> recruiter uh, event soon no we're very good idea we actually do have a prototype not to get too deep um very close, very close. Think of it as a drive-through of sorts with multiple layers. Uh, so yes. Cool, thank you. But still interested. <laughs> okay, last call for questions. Yeah, I mean, everybody's here all week, so feel free to approach anyone and ask more questions. Uh, let me, let's thank the team again for their wonderful presentation. Thank you.